Welcome to What the <coughs> is ORF, part two, the instruments. So how were ORF instruments created? Basically, Carl ORF and another woman started a dance school and eventually ORF decided they wanted to have their own instruments for the dancers. So they wanted the kids to play the instruments. So they started with drums, eventually were like, no, we need more than that. And so he started looking for ideas of how they could um, incorporate instruments for their students. He was inspired by the African marimba and also the Indonesian gamelan, which is this, and adapted them to be used by children. He actually paid other people to adapt them for him. So this is where metallophones and glockenspiels kind of came from, where they have like one note on each of these, and it's made out of metal, whereas the African marimba is the basis for the xylophone that they used. So why were they created? To motivate and give a way for students to improvise. They were developed primarily for pedagogical reasons. So one of the reasons he wanted to create new instruments is he didn't want to use instruments that were tied to any one culture. He wanted instruments that could just be used by anyone and the whole purpose was the pedagogy of teaching music, not any historical or cultural um, value to it necessarily, although he did take inspiration obviously from Indonesia and, and Africa. To have removable bars to create more options for how to teach children and to make them easily accessible to children. It would be rather hard to have like 30 pianos in an elementary music room and also do movement and be able to afford all of them and tune them and etc. But the xylophones and other barred instruments are a little easier to uh, have access to in our classrooms. The number one instrument mistake is playing directly from the volumes without adjusting anything for your teaching situation. The volumes were not made for you to just look at. Those are the yellow books um, that say music for children. Those were not made for you to just pull a, an example from and play. You are meant to take those and create songs from them that work in your classroom, adjusting the accompaniments, adjusting the, the ratio of instruments, the instrument balance, and even the objectives based on what you are teaching. So do not just take a song from the volumes and be like, sweet, let's go play this. That's my lesson for today. It's not what you're supposed to do. Close second is... Never teaching students how to actually hold the mallets or teach them the sound of the instruments can be beautiful when they are played. A lot of kids are overplaying them and hitting them too hard, so you really want to work on that ahead of time. So a couple notes about ORF and culture and the volumes. The farther removed the cultural orientation is from ORF's cultural orientation, the less it is possible to reproduce pieces from the original editions of ORF Schulwerk. So let me just break that down for you. Basically, Orf wrote those volumes, Orf and Kateman, Gunild Kateman, wrote those volumes from their own cultural perspective, and your culture may not identify closely with that type of music, and so you may almost have to create your own volumes if you're in another country or just a different region or setting. Studies have shown that countries that include children's songs, so different schools that include children's songs of native origins have caused a resurgence of interest and in use of those songs. So you want to really find songs valuable to your area and bring those back in or should work. Music sequence should grow organically from spoken language. So for my language, that means we start with rhythm because our, our language is primarily a rhythmic thing. Whereas if you speak in some other languages, they use a lot more tonal and pitch uh, based things. Um, I've heard that about Mandarin and Japanese. I am not, I don't speak either of those, so I can't confirm that officially, but those languages, those cultures may start with pitch before rhythm because of the basis of their language. So what are the main ORF instruments? Body percussion, unpitched percussion such as drums and maracas, singing, xylophones, metallophones, glockenspiels, recorder. We're going to go into some of those. So let's talk about xylophones. They have wooden bars. They make a short sound. They are available in small, medium, and large. I feel like I work at a fast food place. And they are available in soprano, alto, slash tenor, and bass. So I'm going to, from now on, just refer to it as alto because that's what most people do. Um, some of them call it tenor because they have extended notes and I don't know. So most people just refer to them as soprano, alto, and bass. So metallophones have the metal bars. 
They have a longer, more sustained sound, a very mellow sound. They come in small, medium, and large and are available in soprano, alto, and bass. Glockenspiels are the ones that sit closer to the ground. They have a longer sound. They're very bright and bell-like. They have a small and medium sizes. They are very small compared to the xylophones and metallophones, and they're available in soprano and alto. Let's talk about instrument voices. So generally speaking, the smaller instruments make higher sounds and larger instruments make lower sounds. It's really more about the length of the bars even. Um, and so, in fact, when you look at them, the alto glockenspiel plays the exact same notes as the soprano metallophone, but they have a little bit different timbre. So glockenspiels have soprano and alto voiced instruments. So when you use the soprano glockenspiel, it's the highest sound and it's primarily going to be using for color parts. You We've got a an alto glockenspiel here that's a little bigger and a soprano glockenspiel that's here. For the soprano, it sounds like this. And then for alto, They are often used for color parts, so you might go rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, rain on the house top, but not on me. That's the sort of thing you might hear a glockenspiel play. Here are the different instrument voices with xylophones and metallophones. So we've got soprano xylophone, primarily going to be used as a melody in instrumental pieces. This is a soprano xylophone. And sometimes people use what they call mouths of fire, and it makes a really uh, clear sound. So if you're using something where the soprano xylophone uh, has the melody, it's not a piece that you're singing, then you may want to use the mallets of fire. I don't know their official name, I just know look for the ones with the orange. Soprano metallophone is going to be used for slower moving melodies or longer notes because it has a long sustain and it gets really muddy sounding if you try to play fast notes on it. This is a soprano metallophone. Again, use a softer mallet so they don't have such harsh sounds. I actually prefer the felt mallets for metallophones when I can get them. I don't have a pair at my house right now, but yeah, so the felt ones are probably my favorite sound on metallophones. An alto xylophone is going to be used for harmony. It can play quick passages because it has the short wooden sound. This is an alto xylophone. You want to use a little bit harder mallets with this. Alto metallophone is going to be slower or more sustained harmonies. This is an alto metallophone. You want to use slightly softer mallets with it so that it doesn't play too harshly. The bass xylophone is going to be playing the Bordoon, which we will talk about later. This is a bass xylophone. And then a bass metallophone, which is probably the least commonly used, but it's very beautiful, can be used for slower bordoons or a pedal point where you just kind of stay on the same note throughout the song. It's really good for that. This is a bass metallophone. So here are some instrument rules. Always, always, always walk around the instruments, never over. We practice this right away with my whenever I get instruments out for the first time. Play only when you are asked. If you do not enforce this, you are going to hate playing instruments. So the second someone plays, like the first day I might give like one warning, and then after that they lose their mallets for a couple minutes. And the only thing note I will make about this is if you have a child with a learning disability or who's on the autism spectrum, you may have to give them a slightly different number of seconds to stop playing or number of reminders before you take something away. So please be thinking about each child and how it applies to them before. I, I just had a guest teacher that, that took 
mallets away from someone who really shouldn't have had them taken away. So you want to be sensitive to each child and their individual learning situation. Um, use instruments gently. These are not toys. These are instruments, and we make music with them. So we, we want to set that clarification right away. Put your mallets on your shoulders when you stop playing. That will solve 99% of kids playing at the wrong time if you get them to automatically stop and practice going like this. Use your practice time wisely. I always tell them if I can look at you and tell that you're not practicing what I just asked you to, then you're not using your practice time wisely. So if we were supposed to be playing in octaves and you're playing glissandos, then you're going to lose your mallets because you didn't use your time wisely. I also sometimes give them little sections if they've done what's right, where I'll say, okay, you can play what you want for the next 30 seconds as long as you're using it as an instrument. And that kind of gives them the freedom then where they don't feel like they never get to try what they want to try. So it's okay to do that. Instrument playing tips. Play in the middle of the bars. So when I, uh, I always talk to them and actually hold up a bar and say, hey, this is where you want to play. It's right in the middle. Even if the note name's at the end of the bar, you want to play right in the middle of the bar like it's shown in this picture. Wrap your thumb and first finger around the mallets. Keep the rest of the mallet wrapped but loose. I'll show you an example of that. So this is a note about how to hold mallets. When you show kids how to hold mallets, these two fingers are going to be primarily what's holding it, and the other three just wrap around. Pull or bounce the sound out of the instruments. So if you hold the sound down, it doesn't let the bar resonate, and it also bends the mallets. So you don't want to do that. You want to let the sound bounce off or pull the sound out of the bars. The biggest thing you don't want is for them to have pointer fingers, because what happens when kids have pointer fingers is they push down and it bends the mallet. And the other thing that does, it makes it so if you play that way, it doesn't let the bars resonate. So you want to make sure they're bouncing. They're letting it bounce off of the bars and then wrap those fingers around. That will help them have a good, I always say you should be able to feel the end of this wiggle inside of your hands and some kids might want to hold it higher up, whatever is more comfortable for them. Air practice when it's not your turn. I'll show you what that looks like. So let's say you have a part you just taught to your students that goes like this. And you want them to practice it. You give them a little time to practice it and you want to make sure they're actually doing it correct. You would say, okay everyone, you air mallet and I'm gonna play. So the teacher would play and the students would go that allows them to see if they're playing the right thing at the right time, and it also allows you to look out at your students and see if they have the right idea of what they're doing, and it lets them hear the correct example of what to play instead of perhaps what they were playing. And help others when allowed. Notes on ORF instruments. The lowest, left, and longest notes on ORF instruments are C. Okay, so it's, it's this C over here is always gonna be your lowest. And then as they get higher, they get shorter and go to the right. Most instruments end on an A. Some of them, those tenors, will end on a C. Um, so I kind of let kids know that because otherwise if they try to copy you exactly and you're playing on one that ends on A and they have one that ends on C, they'll start playing Cs when they're supposed to be playing As. So just be aware of that. Okay, so one example activity you could do, I love this book. It is the cutest book ever, because look at him. Isn't he adorable? Um, this is Big Scary Monster by Thomas Doherty. And in this book, this monster, he's living at the top of the mountain. So you can talk about how when you turn a glockenspiel on its side, the top of it goes up like this. That would be the top of the mountain. And he's, he's bigger than all the little things that live there. Everything that lives at the top of the mountain is little. And then he slowly climbs down the mountain and everything at the bottom of the mountain is really big. And so you can have them kind of experiment with playing at the top of the mountain when he's up there at the top of the glockenspiel and everything's small and tiny. And then as he gets to the bottom, you can have them play the lower notes. And also it's a good graphic of even like the top of the mountain, the highest part of the glockenspiel is little. And as it goes down, the biggest part of the mountain, the biggest part of the glockenspiel is longer. So um, that's a good simple activity you can do. Pentatonic scales are when you use do, re, mi, so, la, and no, fa, or ti. We talk through this with our students and so that they can eventually figure out what pentatonic scales are on their own. If you say find C pentatonic, they can figure out what notes to take off. 
So you just remove them and then you can use this to play. It's great because there's no half steps so anyone can play any note and it doesn't give you that cringy extreme dissonance that we don't like to hear. Okay, so when you're teaching students to remove bars, I normally start letting them do this around second grade. You need to give them very clear directions. They need to have one hand on each end of the bar and lift it straight up. If they lift it where they are pulling it like this, it ends up bending this peg and that's how those pegs break quicker. So if they are like this and they lift it straight up so it's flat to the floor, then they will be able to do it. Again, two hands straight up, two hands straight up. So now we're in a pentatonic scale and you will need to practice removing them many times with them for them to do it correct. All right, so the pentatonic scale activity, we could take this the children's poem we already did yesterday, and you just play it in a pentatonic scale to the rhythm of the words. Here it is. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, rain on the moon. So they're just practicing really getting the rhythm to the words down on there. Hands together is always going to be easiest for them. start alternating where they switch hands it's another level of difficulty so a bordoon is when you play do and so as the bass line of a song and since we're not in pentatonic anymore I'm gonna put these back on you always start with the lowest do and then the so right above it it gives them the feeling for the resting tone as well as hitting so which is another really strong uh, point in whatever scale you're using. So, so we have four dunes is always do and so. Then here's the suggested sequence. We start with a chord four dune in kindergarten and up. First you do it on the beat, then eventually you'll do a, a rhythmic pattern of some sort. A broken four dune, which is hands alternating, second and up. Crossover four dune, third grade and up. Level four dune is fourth grade and up. And then a single moving bordoon and a double moving bordoon, probably fifth grade and up. Again, it depends on your teaching circumstance. So, for the simple chord bordoon, you are just basically playing rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. And you're just playing it. It could be a different pattern. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. You've got broken board dunes. Again, same song. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. Just alternate them instead. For crossover board dunes, you add the high do. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. Rain on the house top, but not on me. Yes, this one should cross over. You can also add it on the way down if you want. So here's one, two, and that crosses over for three, or if you can add one, two, three, and then you cross, and then you four comes back. Here's what that looks like in person. So it's one, two, three, four. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. So it just stays here and it never moves off of that note. All right, level bordoons is when you have one musician play a bordoon and then another group of musicians play another part of the bordoon. So they might be at different levels. You could do woods and then metals. It, you can just switch it around and make it fun. So single moving bordoon. One note is going to be moving. Rain on the green grass, rain on the trees. If you have a double moving bordoon, Ah, then things are both moving. Now this is probably not what I would pick, but I'm just going to use it because we've already been using some examples with this. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. And it doesn't always have to be just one, it could be. Rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. So you can change it and make it into a broken double board, moving board. Yeah. Okay, body percussion prep. If you're doing a simple board, you're going to be rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. We always prepare through movement before we actually play it on the instruments. Broken board dunes, rain on the green grass, rain on the tree. Keep in mind, you're going to want to do everything backwards. So right now I'm looking at you and I'm actually starting with this hand so that if you were sitting at this instrument, you would start with the correct hand, okay? So I actually have just learned, okay, I do everything backwards so they can copy me. So when they put it on their instruments, it will be correct for them. 
cross over Bordeaux, you're going to do pat, pat, cross. Pat, cross. So for them, it's left, right, left. Left, right, left. And then level Bordeaux, you'd split them into two groups. One group would be here, and the next group would go. And the next group would go. And again, you can add uh, more complexities to that. Moving Bordeaux, you might, if you were going rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, you could just practice the movement to be ready for it. Okay, so the harmonic sequence in ORF, we do start with pentatonic. It allows for easy improvisation without mistakes. We add fa for hexatonic. We then go to functional harmony, harmony with Ionian. And then we go to law-based minor. We then often, after that, it's a little more what the teacher wants to teach as far as the order, but Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, and Mixolydian, um, we teach them in an order where you can talk about some of the similarities between the, the different scales. And then Locrian is not typically used due to the diminished fit, though I'm sure we could do lots of activities in Locrian. Next we're going to talk, I'm going to give you an example of a Lydian Orf piece because I feel like a lot of people haven't heard of one before. So this is a Lydian song and students can play it on bard instruments. It was written by Lisa Sullivan and the first, first our students go through and learn this as a dance and after they've learned a dance that goes with it, we then go and learn the song on instruments. Okay, so let's talk about instrument balance. You want more wood than metal instruments because the wood instruments are going to sound nice and crisp regardless of what you're playing. The metal instruments will get really muddy if you have to play a lot of fast passages. You don't want your instruments to overpower the melodic instruments, so make sure you can always hear the singing or the recorder over the rest of the ensemble. Beginning ensemble may look like this, a bass xylophone, some alto xylophones, a pair of soprano xylophones, and then one each of the alto metallophone, alto glockenspiel, and soprano glockenspiel. Here's some teaching tips. Place your instruments so your students can mirror your movements. You play upside down and backwards just like I was showing you earlier. It lets them just look at it forwards as if they were playing the instrument. Simplify Bordeaux for kids who are really struggling and are frustrated. So if a kid is trying his hardest and just for some reason can't get a crossover Bordeaux yet, you may just want to let him play a broken Bordeaux because then he would at least, it still actually fits very nicely and um, he won't feel like he's sticking out anymore in a negative way. Use a document camera to create an aerial view of your instrument. So if you put a document camera in a way where it's looking down at the top of your instrument, you can actually project that up onto your screen so students can follow your instrument up on the screen, which is pretty cool. I did not come up with that. Thank you to whoever posted that in a Facebook group. If you're introducing something new, you could just show a xylophone visual and then point to the notes on the xylophone visual. I have done that many times. Teach small bits at a time over time. So you don't want to teach everything in one class and think they're going to get it. And we also tend to teach most, we try to get everyone to learn all the parts usually to a song and then eventually separate and say, okay, now you're on metallophone, so you're only playing this one part. Okay, you're on the bass xylophone, you're only going to play this one part. Um, give students practice time during the whole class as a whole class so that they can work at their own speed. For example, sometimes I'll say, okay, here's what we're going to do. I show them and then I say, go ahead and practice it on your own a minute. So they don't have to go at the same speed as everyone else in their class. It sounds a little chaotic. And then after they've had maybe 30 seconds to a minute to try it on their own, I'll say, okay, let's try it together. And then we play it as a group. But kids fix a lot of their own mistakes doing this. So I highly encourage you to give them a try. Uh, partner students up to help each other. One is playing while the other helps monitor. You could say, okay, today while we're playing this, please check to see how they're holding their mallets and let them know what they need to fix when they get done. Or please point to the notes that they should be playing to help them make sure they're playing it at the right time. 
start by keeping a beat with them, but eventually you want them to figure out how to listen to each other and stay together. Encourage them to really feel that inner beat um, inside of them, have that inner hearing so that they can stay together. And also teach them what it sounds like to not sound together. So if they're all playing at the same time, do, 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 it sounds like one giant note. If you're do, 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 are they really playing together? They need to know that that's a sign of that. Have posters showing the right hand or left hand on, up on your walls. By the time you say right hand and give directions, their brains have just figured out what the right hand is. That means they have lost the directions. If you have posters on the wall, it will help them. Or you could say, use your hand closest to the sink or closest to the window. It helps eliminate confusion. If you want to, you could use vinyl stickers to label the letters on the bars. Sometimes it's hard to see the, the letters. So if you have a Cricut or a Silhouette machine, you can use those to make stickers and put them right on the bars. It makes it easier for students to see. Recorder. So recorder was added as an easily accessible melodic instrument in addition to singing. And it was added because it's easy to walk around the room while you're playing it so you can observe the students. Students should experience the sound of the recorder prior to ever learning it. So that means if when they're in K3, you should be using it to direct uh, as a melodic example during movement or instrument activities so that they learn the right sound of it before they ever try to play it. Because we all know, to know how awesome Hot Cross Buns is the first time they play it. But if they've heard a good example, they know it can be a beautiful instrument. Teaching the recorder follows the main tenets of Oric Schulwerk. If you don't know those, um, please look at part one of my presentation about Oric. I really could do a whole presentation on recorders, so I'm not going into that today, as I feel like more people know that than they do the barred instruments. Here's some resources for your classroom. I'm going to touch on the ones that um, you may need to know. So I talked about these two in the other presentation, instrument labels. I'm going to have instrument labels with the names of the instruments. Those will be free through July 3rd. There's ORF rule posters like this, ORF book and presentation that actually has a lot of the different visuals I've used today to show the different um, Bordeaux, etc. And it has a printable student book that goes with it. So if you want students to write out what they're learning, you can do that. There are going to be instrument posters and Bordeaux posters and pentatonic posters. And all of it will be put together into a basics bundle. Lisa Sullivan is the one who wrote the Lydian dance. The treble clef note naming activity is used to help prepare students before they play recorder and before they have to read music on a staff. It is great if you have one-to-one -one technology such as a Chromebook or if you are virtual. It really goes step-by-step -step and is very interactive. It is a Google Slides activity. Desktop percussion talked about last year. It's great if you're on a cart or virtual or actually I had them do it in my classroom without a desktop. They just brought up two pencils and a book and we had a blast. Recorder rules look like this. Glue dancing we talked about in the last activity, but my entire store is 20% off through July 1st. I hope there is something in there that will help your school year be better and smoother. Resources for learning more. So AOSA.org is where you're going to go if you want to learn more about the American Orc Schulwerk Association. Um, I'm going to go through these really quickly. So exploring ORF and discovering ORF have a lot of sequencing and, and details about ORF itself. The game plan curriculum is what I use in my classroom, but I supplement it with a lot of my own activities or activities I've learned at ORF workshops. Elemental composing is if you're interested in writing your own ORF uh, arrangements. Elementaria is written by Gunild Kateman, and she is the main founder of ORF Schulwerk, and you can learn a lot from her original words. This is what I used that had most of the quotes that were from. It's a really concise, nice example of where ORF came from and what it is and where it's going. Don't forget we had this book in here, Big Scary Monster, Thomas Doherty. And thank you to Amy Fenton for looking through this presentation with me, as well as all my Levels instructors. I really appreciate you investing in the next generation of teachers. Quotes were from that awesome book. Here's where the graphics and fonts were from. If you have questions or concerns or just more interest in ORF, feel free to email me at noteworthybyjen.com and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks so much for joining today. Ooh, if you want to know what this is, it's just called a sound machine. And I believe you can find it on Amazon if you want it. It's a lot of fun for those days where you kind of need just a little something extra in your class to get kids motivated. All right, thanks for being here. Have a great one.